Thank you, Frankie, for the introduction, and thank you, Daryl, for the invitation uh, to come and speak with you today. Daryl asked me to come and speak with you about the current challenges we face uh, with race in our community. Uh, this is a difficult time to talk about race. This is a difficult week to talk about race. Uh, our president has complimented Nazis and cursed silent protesters. For many of us, we are in the midst of very dark and troubling times. As a local government law scholar, my writing and teaching focuses on the law and policy related to local government and metropolitan affairs. I view urban and metropolitan development as fundamentally about social justice the development and maintenance of social, political, and economic realities that allow everyone meaningful opportunities to pursue their vision of the good life. My title, The Challenges of Building an Equitable Baton Rouge, understandably begs certain threshold questions. For one, what do I mean by equity? Is that the same as equality? Yes, there is a distinct difference between equality and equity. Equality simply means treating everyone the same. While important, viewing social justice through an equality lens risks exacerbating existing disparities, inequities, and maldistributions. Focusing on equality alone compounds the historic conditions which raise the specter of unfairness in the first place. Equity, on the other hand, recognizes the enduring impact of past inequities and takes that into account in addressing how to give everyone enough resources, access, and voice to be successful. It rejects colorblindness and token diversity in favor of race and class consciousness rooted in a historical experience and a deeply held notion of linked fate. Another question might be, is Baton Rouge not an equitable place? To those people, I say, welcome to our fair city. You're clearly new here. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you stay. Whether we are willing to admit it or not, those of us from here who live here know that we are anything but an equitable community. Quite the contrary. We are a national model for racial and spatial stratification. We are North and South Baton Rouge, separated by a Mason-Dixon line, that is Florida Boulevard or Government Street, depending upon who you talk to. According to a study by 24-7 Wall Street, we are the 13th most racially segregated metropolitan area in the nation. That finding is influenced by our racial income gap. The typical black household earns half of the typical white household in Baton Rouge. Black poverty is approaching 30%. White poverty is just under 11. Racial segregation is the mother of sprawl. Accordingly, Smart Growth America has found us to be the most sprawled out metropolitan area under one million in population, and the sixth most sprawled out metropolitan area of any size. Furthermore, our chart-topping age rate and top 10 murder rate in past years is largely tied to the experiences of people living in two or three zip codes, almost all of them black and poor. A final question to the title might be, well, what exactly is the challenge? Perhaps in this room the challenge is not that great. Much of the information I've just cited you could find out about in Braff's city stats study. Many of you are knowledge experts in a variety of fields. You've engaged some of this data on many occasions. But awareness is only half of the battle. Our understanding of this data and its implications is where we tend to diverge. 
we see the statistics and perhaps we understand intellectually that this does not bode well for our quality of life and economic development aspirations. But finding common ground on a way forward has proven difficult and seemingly harder by the day. Statistics provide a snapshot, a freeze frame of the present. They don't provide a backstory, however. I would posit that we can't agree on a path forward because we don't agree on how we got here in the first place. The stories we tell ourselves about who we are in our journey as a community are vitally important. They shape our historical narrative and our shared identity. They buttress discursive norms, logics, rhetorics, politics that shape policy and drive decisions about the appropriate allocation of the community's limited resources. One widely held view about the explanation for our seemingly intractable, spatially concentrated, intergenerationally occurring, <coughs> persistent black poverty is culture. This is in no way unique to Baton Rouge, nor this current moment. The trope of black communities as sites of lazy, willfully ignorant people who revel in loose morality, irresponsibility, and dependency predates emancipation. This is what is called the culture of poverty thesis, the argument that culture, much more so than economics, history, or structural factors, is the primary driver of black poverty and community decline. Many in our community see the state of our most impoverished and embattled neighborhoods and see merely sites of mass pathology. If black communities are simply collections of people who pathologically make poor decisions and are genetically and culturally predisposed to criminality and dependency, then containment and incarceration appear as rational, legitimate policy responses, no matter the enormity <coughs> of their human and financial fallout. Calls for law and order and personal responsibility tend to precede the deployment of draconian policing, mass incarceration, and an all-out assault on the social safety net. Books like the New Jim Crow, documentaries like 13th have mainstreamed, to some extent, the awareness of racialized mass imprisonment. As the most incarcerated state in the nation, with not a shred of improvement in crime or quality of life to show for it, we know well the failures of this thinking. None of this is to say that we should not enforce the laws or maintain order. It is certainly not to minimize those who consistently make poor decisions or those determined to harm themselves or others. But poor black people do not have a monopoly on poor decision making. Consider what we know about drug enforcement and prosecution. A US Commission on Civil Rights study from the height of the drug war found that while blacks accounted for a mere 14% of drug users, they represented 35% of the arrests, 55% of the convictions, 75% of the prison admissions. Indeed, race not only impacts who is charged and who locks up, but the very definition of crime and the appropriate punishment altogether. When we think about the challenge of equity in cities like Baton Rouge, there is a broader history we must contend with. It is a history that counters the culture of poverty thesis. There has been an explosion in scholarship and interest lately uh, on the deep legacy of how urban policy writ large was deployed to exclude blacks from middle class opportunities created and subsidized in part by their tax dollars, public service, and military sacrifice. I've written extensively about how residential racial segregation has been the driving logic behind land use decisions and urban development patterns of the American metropolis for more than a century. The scope of these policies is vast, defining every endeavor related to the creation, management, and transformation of the built environment in both city and suburb. 
They have shaped metropolitan areas, solidifying patterns of investment, wealth creation, resource disparities, and social and economic regulation that continue to this day. Six practices are worthy of a brief review. First, there were the explicit residential segregation laws passed by cities at the turn of the 20th century, outlawed by the court in 1917. However, Louisiana's segregation law, a statewide law, uh, was not affected by that ruling and remained in force uh, for much longer. Second, there were racially restrictive covenants. Developers, city leaders, and white homeowners promoted racially restrictive covenants as essential to retaining home values as black people were considered, as a matter of policy, to be a blight. The Supreme Court struck those down in 1948. The design of public spaces also served to reinforce black subordination. The decision to extend sidewalks, bike paths, other connective infrastructure, as well as the design of bridges, highways, public parks, were all deployed in significant measure to enforce segregation. For more than half a century, the Federal Housing Administration promoted redlining, a consciously racist housing finance policy that cheated black people out of government-backed mortgage finance market, arguably the largest driver of wealth creation in the 20th century. From 1934 to 1962, the FHA underwrote $120 billion in mortgage loans. More than 98% of them went to white borrowers. Fifth, exclusionary zoning allowed locals, mostly in suburban settings, to use race-neutral tools of minimum lot sizes and prohibitions on multifamily housing to erect barriers to black access to white neighborhoods. Finally, local police, civic groups, and elected officials openly or tacitly endorse vigilante violence to not only scare black families away from integrating neighborhoods, but to also intimidate whites from selling to black homeowners. All of this has local relevance. Like many cities, we intentionally ran our interstates through black communities, disrupting their social fabrics and undermining property values. We stunted the development of our parks to avoid integration. We treated our schools the same. Our quest for racial segregation has driven an urban form dominated by unconnected streets and one-way-in, one-way-out neighborhoods that leave us all sitting in the worst traffic in the nation. This history is not even history. It's ongoing. Consider the black World War II veteran who was denied a VA-backed mortgage and, if granted one at all, was limited to segregated neighborhoods where poorly planned and, and, and poorly constructed public housing developments were ultimately located. His family was sent on an entirely different trajectory financially than his white counterparts. The lost ability to build and transfer generational wealth through home ownership is the basis of our racial wealth gap that is only widening. Add to that the deliberate divestment in those neighborhoods, the stress and trauma of living amidst concentrated poverty, the pervasive and still existing racial pay disparities, and other devices of subordination, all of it intergenerationally transferred, and you get a picture of the anatomy of what we are facing today. None of this, again, excuses criminality. None of it excuses irresponsibility. Nor am I unaware of the mounting voices in the black community crying out for an end to the killing we're seeing right now. But research has shown that even these struggles accrue more to individual responses to structural and historic conditions than some all-encompassing culture. This is why the culture of poverty thesis is so incoherent and morally bankrupt. It calls into question the seriousness of, of, of our efforts to want to turn our communities around. Let's be clear. There is no urban crisis in Baton Rouge. Crisis implies something unexpected, something unplanned. We created the two Baton Rouges. We did it consciously and deliberately, much of it within the lifetimes of everyone in this room. We created the preconditions for the deprivation, the poverty, the misery, the isolation 
the crime and all of the manner of social decay that are the regrettable but predictable <coughs> trajectories of our most embattled neighborhoods. Okay, by now you must be ready for the upshot. <laughs> What's the payoff, Chris? The good news is that we have yet to scratch the surface of what we could be doing to turn things around. Our only coordinated response to these problems has been through the criminal justice system. That has been an unmitigated failure, measured and wasted black life, a squandered public trust, unsustainable fiscal imbalances, and a reputation for consistently choosing to cut off our noses to spite our collective faces. Take, for instance, what we learned from the recent Brave controversy. <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with my writings on the issue. A review of the communication between Mayor Broom's office and the Department of Justice in the early weeks and months of her administration revealed that even when the federal government gave us the money to pursue national violence elimination best practices, which involved both increasing the capacity of law enforcement and engaging grassroots community organizers. We chose to do the former and not the latter, literally leaving the money on the table to be refunded to the federal government and the grant canceled. That's not reason, you know, past history. That's, that's what we just did. Brave did impact violence reduction. It did some good, but imagine what might have been accomplished if we had pursued a more equitable, a more holistic approach. Fortunately, we have other opportunities. We must support black and minority-owned business growth by pursuing equity in city parish contract. Studies show that black businesses anchor black communities our abysmal performance in this regard calls into question the seriousness of our pursuit of sustainable and inclusive economic development. Our anti-poverty toolkit must expand to include innovations like worker-owned cooperatives. Even if we land the large employer who chooses to locate in the blighted area of North Baton Rouge, existing skills gaps and the immediacy of the needs there requires the pursuit of more localized, solutions that help people be the agents of their own turnaround. We must get serious about blight elimination, a known driver of crime and urban decay. Through a progressive blight elimination program, we can create job opportunities while rehabbing communities. Chicago's Neighborhood Rebuild pilot program is doing just that. Investments in public infrastructure like libraries, parks, and mass transit might be obvious on a list like this, but make no mistake, we know that these are politically controversial matters in Baton Rouge. They are vulnerable to being overturned, and the progress, the little progress we're making now, uh, is, could be in jeopardy. We must be able to reaffirm public values, public resources, uh, and, and, and the value of public infrastructure across our partisan divides. And if we're going to invest millions in public development projects, we should prioritize those areas least likely to experience private sector development. While we must develop all of Baton Rouge, I live in South Baton Rouge, South Baton Rouge cannot hoard all of the opportunity in the region. It just can't. It's not smart development. It certainly isn't equitable, and it doesn't deal with the intractable, seemingly intractable problems we know bedevil our aspirations to be a great city. In the wake of the killing of Alton Sterling and officers Gerald, Garofalo, and Jackson, I encountered someone, many people actually, who lamented, this is not who we are. My response was simply, no. This is exactly who we are. This is who we've always been. The question going forward, however, is who will we be? Ladies and gentlemen, we must accept that race is not some card game that forces us into a cynical zero-sum tug of war for moral superiority. 
The point of confronting this legacy is not to leverage guilt or extort some cheap symbolic concession. Race is the essential logic undergirding our social, spatial, economic, and political condition. We can't rebrand our way out of it. We can't kumbaya our way out of it either. Our problems with crime, education, blight, and social division are rooted in a specific history that we must own up to and we must confront in order to overcome. We are the only ones that can change course. And so the challenge to building a more equitable Baton Rouge is simply us. Thank you so much. We have a few moments if you, if, if you have any questions. We have uh, members of my team on either end of the dais who will run out to you with a microphone so that everybody can hear your question. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, I'm Janet Simmons with Hope Ministries, and we actually were a recipient of some of the Brave money. In the first two years during the Brave contract, murders were reduced by 20, 25 murders in the first year. And it was very successful boots on the ground effort by people not just law enforcement. And so I'd like to know a little bit more about your thoughts on that because the grant actually wasn't canceled, it was just not renewed. Yeah, uh, it wasn't renewed, I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, uh, my reference was in response to, I believe, the over a million dollars that we had to send back uh, that wasn't spent. Um, I am sure you, working in the community and working in social services, uh, know many organizations who are on the ground, I sit on the board of some, right, uh, who do this kind of work. It's not for want of uh, having the capacity on the ground to spend a million dollars to do community work to complement a law enforcement method. In the aftermath of the Brave story, uh, we saw discussions that uh, engaging the handful of community organizers who were given a paltry amount of dollars to do some work, work that they have a proven track record of doing, was maligned as hug a thug, right? Um, we saw that. Uh, we have to be honest about that. Uh, and those were people in official capacities making those comments. Um, so what does it say? when one of the most segregated, one of the most impoverished communities tells the federal government, who says, here's money to do best practice work, ah, we don't need a million of it. Yeah, we're impoverished, yeah, we're struggling, but we send the money back, we've got to do better. And so I know that there, there are bright spots in the BRAVE program and people have done incredible work. I, I wish we could have done more and I wish that wasn't the story to how we no longer have the BRAVE grant. Chris, great talk. Um, you mentioned sprawl. You know, I've been in this uh, city for almost 20 years. And in those years, I've, I've seen that this city expand in one direction, pretty much in one direction, and deteriorate in the other direction. Um, and and I've, I've seen, basically, uh, the land use policy uh, enacted by our planning commission that doesn't check sprawl, but contributes to it. You've got uh, certainly the ear of the, the mayor has your ear, and you guys, I'm sure, talk about some of these issues. What is Mayor Broom's vision for us? I mean, is, is there something that she plans to do to try to get? Uh, I, I, I do not want to speak for the mayor, <laughs> nor her vision, particularly well, in her absence. Um, yes. What's, what's your uh, my solution, again, as, as I mentioned, I think there are a number of models. I cited the Chicago one, uh, uh, Pennsylvania's uh, in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh are doing some innovative things around blight elimination, around land banking. Um, uh, I think we can match that with innovative approaches like stimulating worker-owned cooperatives in neighborhoods where uh, the big investment, the big, you know, uh, development may not be coming anytime soon and people have immediate needs to earn income, to be productive, uh, and, uh, and we know that that contributes to, to crime elimination uh, uh, and a host of other uh, issues. So I, I think that there are things, uh, frankly there are capacities uh, existing that we are not utilizing. 
Um, uh, and so I would start there uh, with blight elimination, uh, with looking at how uh, we craft a workable strategy for developing uh, North Baton Rouge uh, and other blighted and disinvested areas, uh, and I'd begin there. Uh, it, it, so I don't think that sprawl is inevitable. I do think, however, that much of the policy that has limited sprawl and encourage smart growth in, in the states that are doing this well is state policy. Um, uh, it, it is somewhat top-down, which people have an aversion to because it sounds anti-freedom, right? Uh, but we pay a price uh, for the urban form that we have, uh, and it's, it, it, in most cases, because of, of, of law, uh, state policy is going to have to, to drive that. We can't compel Prairie View to do anything they don't want to. We can't even compel the, the municipalities within East Baton Rouge Parish to do things they don't want to. So, so, so uh, that has to, to roll up at a higher level, I think, to be effective. What sort of effect, if any, have you seen uh, last summer's flood have on exacerbating um, some of the differences that we see in our city, especially the spatial differences you reference? Um, I, I think it'll be interesting. I don't feel entirely up to date where, as to where the recovery efforts are. I know that there are many efforts underway, whether or not neighborhoods will be able to fully come back. Uh, usually, as New Orleans shows us, everyone doesn't come back. And so we have jack-o'-lantern neighborhoods. That is a drag on property values. Uh, that is a disincentive for even the people who want to return to their neighborhoods to invest their money uh, uh, and remain there. Uh, and so I think we're still seeing how that is going to unfold. Cities, and we're no different, rely heavily on federal support uh, to orchestrate that. Um, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not where I want to be in understanding exactly where recovery is today, but uh, I, I think we have several examples of what we don't want to see happen. Uh, there's rumors that the St. George breakaway thing may be coming up again since the two year uh, it was over. Any, any thoughts on that and how it affects some of the things you talked about? Yes, so uh, it, it's a topic I've written about extensively around the nation. We have what uh, some scholars call a cityhood movement, uh, where local communities are looking to break off mostly to contain, as I call it, the redistributional impact of their tax dollars, right? Uh, I want that tax dollar to come back to me as a whole dollar. I don't want to spend on anything or anybody right, that I, I, I don't support. That is a different social contract uh, than uh, the America of at least up to now. Um, and so if local law, if, if, if boundary and municipal uh, laws at the state level are weak and ours are, uh, it's very easy to cordon off into your own municipality. The challenge is obviously you do have requirements uh, to be fiscally stable. Uh, and so I know the city has pursued certain annexations um, uh, that may have zapped some of the commercial uh, um, viability of the St. George model, uh, but the desire is still there. It is motivated by uh, uh, concerns about schooling, all of them very legitimate concerns. Uh, and our challenges around education uh, in the present, right, uh, just appear as kind of a natural condition. Uh, and so it's important to recount the history that, that at least clarifies to us why the schools are the way they are, uh, in part. Uh, and then, and it's not to say that administrative you know, issues and uh, funding uh, disparities and, uh, and, and the initiative of parents and others on the ground to want these schools to be better, that that doesn't play a role. Of course it does. But um, we've got to get a handle on our schools. Much of the data suggests that that is inevitably tied to poverty. Uh, and so um, I don't think any of that is going to stop those who want to separate. Uh, but at least it can help um, ground our discussion uh, about what are these metropolitan challenges we face going forward and how do we talk about them and, and, and work on them. I think we have time for one more, Todd. Okay, thank you. Chris, what are your thoughts on making conversations <laughs> about race more comfortable and productive? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, so that's question. 
I will, I will, I will give an analogy and tell a, a, a quick story. Um, I, I was in, uh, engaged in a program back in grad school um, uh, that was discussing issues of rape. Um, uh, uh, w uh, women sharing their experiences uh, in dealing with men, most of it intimate partner violence, most of it intraracially. Uh, it was a very difficult and painful discussion and I, I felt a little you know, out of place. Uh, and uh, when it t came time for question and answer, um, a, a gentleman stood up and started speaking about uh, men's experiences and, and the male perspective and the ladies shut him down immediately. And they said, sir, you will not control this space. Not today. Your feelings will not be centered, because they always have, right? And that you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable right now. Because your discomfort is essential to us being able to speak, be able to have voice, be able to have this experience to move forward. Uh, and I was thankful for him because I think I had a hand going up too to say something equally as tone deaf and sensitive as he had offered. So when it comes to comfort, um, that might be the biggest roadblock you know, that we face. We have to get over ourselves. Everything is not designed to make us comfortable. Um, everyone hasn't always been comfortable. Uh, there are rooms that I walk in and I'm someone who's been comfortable. And many of you know my family, my upbringing, I've had a beautiful life. Um, uh, and so there are many privileges that I've enjoyed uh, that, that make me step back when people are talking about poverty, when people are talking about uh, gender, when people are talking about other experiences, and let them be centered. Let their stories be centered, understanding that their voices have historically been marginalized, that I likely have participated wittingly or unwittingly in that marginalization. And if I can just step back, I might learn something. If I can be uncomfortable and be comfortable in being uncomfortable, uh, then maybe something might happen. And so that's, uh, that's all I got for you, Tom. <laughs>